Today's passage is Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. Once again, Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory and with the holy angels. Amen. Please allow me to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us once again to be able to gather together to worship you. We thank you for this privilege. Today, too, Lord, we'll have the opportunity to get, grow a little closer to you and to hear words from you. We ask that we'll be able to understand Jesus in even just a little bit better manner today. So, Lord, please open our hearts and allow them to be able to hear you speak to us. May the Holy Spirit work abundantly at this time as well and fill us. Please use us, Lord. This is our expectation from our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Hello, everyone. Today, we're going to be going over a message from the passage that was read just a moment ago. Last month, in, on October 29th, there was a very interesting Guinness uh, World Record that was set in Japan. Around the entire country, they had 178 people gather, and they were all the same exact name, Hirokazu Tanaka. And so they all gathered in Shibuya, in Tokyo to, uh, to obtain this world record of having the most people of the same name in the same place. <laughs> and this was actually something that was uh, initiated by Hirokazu Tanaka, <laughs> who worked for an, works for an advertising agency in Tokyo. He was actually drafted for a baseball team early on in life, and then when he was when he at that time he found this person the exact same name as him and he really just felt the strange affinity for that person and so he looked on the internet to try and find if there were other famous people with the same name as him and he found people and he actually went to see them 
and it was you know it was really easy to get to know these people because they have the same name and so on the internet he found out that there was actually about 850 people with the same exact name of Hirokazu Tanaka and he wanted to have the Guinness Book World Record for having the largest number of people the same name in the same place and so they actually had this um, twice before in 1994 and 2005 um, I'm uh, sorry, 2011, 2017, but uh, neither time worked out. But this time it did. The best uh, record so far was actually in 2005 but the, in America by the name of people with Mar Martha Stewart. However, to this year, they were able to achieve the new record. One thing you'd wonder about was, well, okay, so for these people get together, what do they do? Well, they exchange business cards because they all have the same name, so it's kind of pointless that they're exchanging business cards. But you'd see that all these people with the same name are doing all kinds of different things, and apparently that's really interesting. And because the names are the same, they all had to have a nickname in order to tell themselves apart. And then they even sang this original Hirokazu Tanaka song at the end. And so it seems kind of like a fun event, don't you think so? And <laughs> I'm really jealous because there's definitely nobody with the same name as me in the country. <laughs> Your parents have all given you names, and they've likely thought a lot about what your name would be. And the name of a person actually ex uh, defines who they are, right? In today's passage, we're looking at how Jesus is talking to the disciples and how he's asking them, who am I? At this time, Jesus was going with his disciples north of the Sea of Galilee to the city or uh, village of Caesarea Philippi. And this was actually an area where there was a lot of pagan god idols and idol worship going on. And this was also a place where that there was a Roman a temple for the Roman Empire Emperor, sorry. The people in that area worshipped the Roman Emperor at that time and Jesus specifically took this opportunity to actually ask, who am I at that time? So today we're going to be looking at the topic of take your cross, take up your cross and follow me with three main points. The first point today is who is Jesus? Jesus asked the disciples a question. He says, who do people say I am? And this question should have been easy for the, dis the disciples to answer because they just had to tell Jesus what other people said of him. And so they did. And they told him exactly what other people were saying about him in t verse 28. Some say to John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say one of the prophets. You can see how people were thinking of Jesus in different ways. However, all these answers were insufficient because they were all denying that Jesus was anything better than just a person or denying that he was uh, unique in all ways. So Jesus then asked the following question of the disciples in verse 29. But what about you? Who do you say I am? So the question was directly uh, uh, directed at the disciples. So then they really had to be think and they were so they were actually following Jesus because they believed he was the Messiah. However, when they were facing the Pharisees and the Pharisees were saying he is not the Messiah or seeing, being around other people going away from Jesus, it's likely that their conviction about Jesus would have wavered. So at this time, this is spe specifically what Jesus was asking, and Peter is the one who answered. And he confessed amazing faith. He said, you are the Christ, or you are the Messiah. In a parallel passage, it says, you are the living God Christ. In other words, you are the, self, uh, the Savior and the Messiah. So who is Jesus Christ? In the present day, this is a question that a lot of people have different answers on. Before you became Christian, who is it that you thought Jesus was? There's some people who say, well, he's a 
Christian teacher or a saint or a moral teacher. And that's maybe their opinion of him. In history, you can see that you have the many people have the opportunity to learn about Jesus as a historical character. However, when we are, if we really want to know who Jesus is, we need to read the Bible because that has the most information about him. The Bible, as I've said before, is the best seller book in the world, and it's the book that is read by the most people everywhere. Most people. Who are, people who read the Bible ha, are able to apply what they learn from the Bible in their counseling or business or other jobs as well. There's a lot of books in bookstores that are sold that are actually based off the essence of truth in the Bible, for example, counseling books and so on. However, regardless of how much you read the Bible and have knowledge about it, and regardless of how many good hints you gain about life from reading it, unless you have the faith of Peter, as Peter did, to confess that. Jesus is the Christ, it really has no meaning. So you've probably heard that all roads lead to Rome, and, and in this way, in the Bible, all verses lead to Jesus. It all leads to his,、uh, his death on the cross and salvation, and、uh, so、death on the cross, resurrection, and salvation. In John 20 31, it says, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You can see how this is, can be said about the Bible in its entirety as well. Regardless of how much knowledge you have about the Bible, unless you can profess him as being your Savior, then your life cannot be、uh, changed from the base. And you cannot have a true relationship with God either. So, when we confess that、uh, Jesus is God or God is Lord of our lives, then we can have, we realize that there's a great、um, calling upon our lives. Let's look at the second point it's taking up your cross. Peter had confessed amazing faith in this passage. And, but if you think about the, the image that the disciples had in general about Jesus, it kind of actually changed from what they originally thought. They were originally thinking that the Israel, people of Israel would be、um, saved or rescued from the Roman government through a military leader in the form of the Messiah. However, Jesus was trying to convey to them that his purpose was not to be some military leader but, and not to just help out people of Israel, but actually to provide salvation for all people in the world. And that's why the disciples here are, are told,、uh, have to face what Jesus' plan was. Verse. 30, verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. However, when the disciples, the disciples were not able to accept this、uh, truth that Jesus would die on the cross and be resurrected, they couldn't believe that the Messiah would die. When that kind of topic came up, who is it that <laughs> would break the silence? Peter. And he said, he spoke plainly to Jesus, it says, and he just rebuked him, it says. In other words, he was telling Jesus, the Pharisees are coming after you. If that's the situation, then you can't die. You need to just, you know, try harder or something. And in response to Peter, Jesus said, and this is, <laughs> this is probably something that anybody would not want to hear get behind me, Satan. Why is it that Jesus would say something so strong to Peter? Well, it's because that Peter was actually, it's not because Peter was some form of Satan, it's that Peter was trying to destroy the plan of Jesus. And in that way,、uh, Jesus was not willing to go with it. 
After Jesus rebuked Peter, Jesus said to the disciples and talked sorry, talked to them and、uh, confirmed their conviction of following him. It says, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In order to become a disciple, you have to let go of yourself and follow the, the cross. What does that mean? To throw yourself away or to set yourself aside means to not focus completely on yourself, but rather have the perspective of following God and take on God's perspective. So in your life, it's not that what you want to do all the time, but rather what does God want to do through you that becomes your focal point. And what does it mean to carry your cross or take it up? It means that you understand that Jesus was following God's command when he took up the cross and died. And in that way, we too are to fulfill God's calling for us upon our lives. That is what it means to take up your cross. So, what is it that、uh, God is asking of us? What is it that's our calling? Well, there's three different aspects of this, and let's look at that for just a moment. The first one is that it's something that is voluntarily done. In those days, anyone who received the death penalty on the cross had to carry the, their cross all the way up to the location of execution, and that's what Jesus had to do as well. However, there was a big difference from what Jesus did and other prisoners or criminals on death row at that time. And that's that Jesus was not carrying a cross of sin that he had committed because he didn't commit any sin. He was just following what God asked him to do, and in that way, he was carrying the cross. For that reason, someone who follows God. Will have to undergo things and take, th- take inconveniences and painful things up voluntarily. These are things where you prob- possibly can、um, just avoid them if you want to, and then you won't、uh, have to deal with difficulties. However, anyone who truly wants to follow God will have to make sacrifices to do so. In the church, there are Are a lot of ministries and different、uh, things that people do to help around the church. There's a lot of people who come to the church, and through these ministries, they can come to know about Jesus. In order to help the community, there are also ministries that help the community. There are also various、uh, things that people do to help out with the exact. Um, services in the church. There's the EFL program and COC program for children as well. God works in our hearts and likely has a specific ministry in mind for each of us. And it's not something that's mandated, and you don't have to do it. And if you don't do it, it's not going to be that anybody's getting on your case. However, if you do have that desire, it's Best to take a step forward and to take action on doing it. In the, in the Chinese、uh, hymn, th- there's the following、uh, lyrics There's many people that want to go into heaven. There's many people who try to, but there's a few people who want to carry Jesus' cross. Yesterday, there was a, a group for the youth of the church called Seed, and they There w a s a lot of people in the church who helped out to make it a success. In addition, today you can see in the back there's a lot of handmade goods that are going to be sold to,、uh, for the proceeds to benefit Joyful Christmas. And you can see how a lot of people have put in time and effort to make that possible as well. On Sunday, not only, but also on weekdays, there's a lot of people who are helping out of the church in various ways as the body of the church. Those people are using. Or、they're actually taking up their cross and doing what God is asking of them. We too, if we have a specific ministry in mind that God is asking us to do, we should take action on that. The second、uh, aspect of taking up the cross is that 
it involves pain. As Jesus went through pain with the cross, we too, in our efforts, in our ministries, have painful experiences likely. If you're looking back over history, there's been a lot of Christians who have done amazing things. However, in many of those cases, there's, it's often the focus is put on the great thing that they did, but it's not giving acknowledgement to the various trials and tribulations and painful experiences and hard work that they had to go through in order to accomplish what they did accomplish. For example, Mother Teresa is one example. In all of the work that she did, there was a lot of people, even non-Christians, who are quite aware of what she accomplished. And, what, and she, however, had a lot of difficulties to accomplish what she did. When she was 36 years old, she was, she was determined to follow God's calling on her life and went alone to the slums. When she was there, she, in the first day, She was trying to find a house that she could rent or borrow for her mission work. However, after work, walking around a day, she couldn't find anything. On the second day, and the third, and the fourth, and fifth, and she was just walking around to find somewhere. She never could find a place. After one week, she still had no place to, to establish her mission work. In her journal for that day, she wrote the following. In this past week, I've walked all day, every day. My legs are so tired. The devil keeps telling me to just give up and to just go back to where I came from. And in doing so, I will have a, a easy life. And I just ask God, what should I do with the tears in my eyes? I'm so weak. And God, please give me the courage to fight against my weakness. Am I making a mistake? And she, when she was helping people dying on the streets, she wasn't trying to force. Uh, she was also she was also um, confused by other people thinking that they were trying to. She was trying to force people to um, believe in Jesus Christ. She was also um, mis uh, misunderstood as uh, wor wor working for human trafficking. It said that Mother Teresa never read any of the books written about her. One reason is she didn't want to be exposed to slander. And one, the other reason, is that she didn't want to receive praise on earth for what she did. In the same way, when we are given a desire to do something and to help out with ministries, it's likely that we have difficulties. We experience There's things that don't happen the way we expect, or we're misunderstood, or there's problems we have with other people as well. And in those times that we can kind of waver in our thoughts, we just think, gosh, what if I had just not even done this? Then I wouldn't have had to go through this difficulty. So the cross that we're bearing uh, has a third aspect as well, in that it sees the resurrection. Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and on the third day was resurrected. In the same way, through our ministries and our work, even if we do go through difficult times, we will have, uh, we will be able to see God's amazing glory expressed through what we're doing. And what we do, our ministries, actually provides opportunity for other people to become broken and to see Jesus Christ and for them to be recreated as well. And to have that opportunity is something that is truly a, a, a gift from God. As for myself, I'm quite excited every time every per a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ to be there at the instant when they make that decision. And that truly is a, a great joy in my life, to see people who are saved and then to see these people working in ministries and growing in their faith and to see them being Uh, changed and um, regenerated through Jesus Christ. There's a, a person who worked a long time in this school, uh, the church school, and I would like to share a, a poem of what they wrote. They said, I am a teacher, 
And when children uh, ask me why, it's my job to answer them. And I've done, worked at a lot, lot of different locations. And sometimes I'm kind of like Ann Sullivan telling Helen Keller about the universe ministry. Sometimes I'm like Aesop and Anderson. And sometimes I tell children the truth as a substitute parent. Regardless of whether these children I teach forget about me, it's likely that they will remember who I was, what kind of person I was. And it's likely they, I, I can share in their joy when they get married or have children of their own. And I, it's, it's also an opportunity for me to speak into their lives. And every day, I can even serve as a coach or a medical assistant or a doctor or a teacher. I have all kinds of different roles that I play as a teacher in their lives. I have oh, never wanted to desire wealth or honor from being a teacher, but rather to just honor God through my calling to help these children and to unearth the sleeping talent in each of their hearts. I am. There's nothing greater I have enjoyed doing in my life. And I've been able to see people do interesting, great things through this. And I know what's been going on uh, in these people's lives because I'm able to share the truth of the Bible with them. The reason why I have an amazing life is because I'm able to teach these children and I'm able to speak into the lives of the future. Through this work that I do, I'm able to express my joy and thanks to God. Based on some data, there is about a 50% uh, 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 truth that uh, children who went to a church event or a church school at a young, a Sunday school at a young age, come to faith later in, in their life. And so to plant seeds of truth in children is truly an important thing. So there's all kinds of different ministries and jobs that people do around the world voluntarily. And because of that, all kinds of different problems arise. However, God always has a glorious plan and can work through all of these difficulties and all the mysteries we have. We have the opportunity to meet people and to help people and to be recreated ourselves. And that's something that is truly can't be experienced in any other way. And when we are bearing our cross and stepping out in faith and what God has asked to do, there's nothing we can regret about it. Let's look at the third and final point today. It's anticipation of eternity. Jesus Christ uh, said in verses 35 and 36 to the disciples, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? So Jesus here, when he was walking with the disciples, explained that his life and their lives would not end on earth. He was telling them to focus on eternity. Uh, when you think about eternity, is there some specific point in life when that's come to mind? For me, the first time I really thought about eternity was in elementary school in the summer. I went out in the scorching sun, and I was just totally... Um, uh, my teacher was really, really angry at me, and he was just super angry. And he would just, just not stop talking. He was scolding me continuously, 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 and he just wouldn't stop. And it just kept going and going and going and going. And I just stared up the scorching sun and was like, wow, how long is this going to go on? Eternally? And that's the first time eternity came to my mind. So eternity is really difficult to imagine, isn't it? For example... I have this microphone cable here, you can see, and if you pull it out and stretch it out eternally, or <laughs> as long as you can, then you can realize it just keeps going and going and going. And that's how you can think about eternity. And if that's the truth about eternity, then our lives here on earth, how, how, sh how long of a distance is that? 
it's probably just just a tiny little mark with a white pen on the entire cable. That's the length of our uh, life here on Earth in comparison with eternity. Many people focus all of their energy and everything on that little white speck on the cord, on the cable. However, if our lives just ended here on Earth, you know, then maybe that would make sense. However, we know that our lives are not something to end just when we die here. But rather, because of Jesus Christ and what he has done, his work on the cross for us, we can have eternal life. It is promised to us. And this eternal life is what is a place that it's not full of pain and hurt, but rather a place we spend with Jesus and a place where we can see all kinds of people who have already died and gone to be with Jesus. And it's going to be a great time of joy. In comparison with eternity, our lives here on earth are just an instant. And in light of that, when we're thinking of our lives here, we're not, we shouldn't be focused on everything here, but rather focused on living our lives in light of eternity. And that is what God is asking us to do. He's asking us to take up our cross in light of that. On earth, we have a calling from God, and in many cases, it's something that's not exactly recommend, uh, uh, revered by other people or noticed. And there's a lot of things where we don't get recognized for work we do. And there's many times, actually, we get uh, um, misunderstood because of it. However, God encourages us that because it's just an instant that we should be following Him and honoring and glorifying Him. By following God on earth, when we go up to heaven, He's going to say the following. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. And with those words from Jesus, we can receive various rewards in heaven as well. To get everything around the world and to accomplish everything in the world, that's not what our goal is as a Christian. Our goal is to focus on eternity and to live in light of that and to walk with God in light of that as well. Each of us has a different calling on our lives and a different uh, cross or responsibility to uh, do so let's be responsible for what God has called us to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to worship you again today. Today we've looked at a conversation between Jesus and the disciples. We've seen how you said that we are to let go of ourselves and to take up our cross and to follow you. We each have a different calling upon our lives and a different cross that we are to take up. And this isn't something where we are forced to do it or have to do it, and nobody will complain if we don't. However, we know that if we are called to work with a specific ministry or do a specific job at the church as a volunteer, that it is worth the time and effort and difficulties and sacrifice to do it. Allow us, Lord, to remember that once again today. And in our lives, when we are successful accomplishing this, we know that you will be faithful to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Allow us, Lord, to look forward to that as well as various rewards in heaven. Dear Lord, we ask that in our daily lives you strengthen us and allow us to overcome various trials that come our way. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you. Pray in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we'll have a moment to pray in silence. <laughs> 